Our first guest for you today, Paul Holes, really embodies that can't stop, won't stop mentality. For more than 27 years, the legendary cold case investigator used his determination to track down some of America's most notorious killers. And now, in his best-selling memoir, it's now in paperback, new in paperback this month, in fact, the father of four pulls back the curtain on his story career, including his headline-making hunt for one of the most elusive and infamous murderers in American history, the Golden State Killer. Take a look. It's the memoir that became an instant New York Times bestseller, Unmask, My Life Solving America's Cold Cases, details the decades-long career of famed investigator Paul Holes. Lifting up the crime scene tape, Paul takes readers on a gripping journey inside some of his most infamous cases, from the 1991 kidnapping of J.C. Duggar, to the 2002 murder of Lacey Peterson and her unborn son, Connor. I met mother and child in the morgue, and even with all my experience with evil, it's something I'll never forget. But it was his hunt for the Golden State Killer that made him a true crime legend. Cold cases were my passion. This one was an obsession. Over the course of two decades, the notorious serial predator was behind at least 13 murders and 50 rapes in California. In the 70s and 80s, he'd cut a wide swath of psychological terror across the state with his meticulously planned attacks, breaking into homes in the middle of the night. During his reign of terror, he even taught some of his victims with phone calls after the attacks. For more than 20 years, Paul never stopped searching. And in 2018, he finally cracked the case wide open using DNA from crime scenes to find a distant relative through a popular genealogy website. We found the needle in the haystack, and it was right here in Sacramento. The monster he'd been hunting turned out to be a former police officer, Joseph James D'Angelo Jr., who in 2020 was sentenced to life without parole after confessing to the crimes. He stole my youth my innocence. Who could have grown up to be? I guess I'll never know. Now, for the first time ever, Paul is opening up not only about the crimes he's helped solve, but the toll they've taken on his life. TanFam, please welcome investigator Paul Holes to our show. Thank you. Um, first of all, you know, you're, you are truly someone that I admire. Being a reporter for 30 years, hosting a crime show, I've reported these. You are on the front lines of finding justice for people. And to your point in the book, the, the title of it, Unmask, you really are taking off the mask on, on the toll that it takes. And you've been hearing from law enforcement around the country saying thank you for sharing this part of the story. Yeah, you know, the book originally was going to be a deep dive into the Golden State Killer investigation. But as I was going through the book and working with my collaborator and, and publisher, it really became apparent that all these cases I was involved with took a huge toll on me. Yeah. And as with other professionals, even though now I very much am in the true crime space, I come from real crime. I've seen the real horrors that these types of offenders do to victims and the victims' families. Um, and that's something that now I recognize, mm. that it's so important to get that message out there, is right. that the people that work these types of cases, we are impacted. Yeah. You know, it's to the point, what I used to host a show, Deadline Crime, and I took a break from it for a while because I was watching a lot of shows, and no offense to them, but I felt like they were not really showing people, this is someone who won't go home. Yeah. This is someone's mother, their friend. This is a loved one who will not wake up to have another birthday. And you, you, you really give us this rawness of these stories and the monsters behind them. The, the day before your retirement, 2018, you've been searching for the Golden State Killer for decades. You drove to the home of Joseph James D'Angelo Jr., who at the time was the prime suspect. So you're at his home. You're parked outside of his home. And you talk about that you just wanted to confront him. And you knew that that would have jeopardized the case. You wrote, yearning to go to the door was overwhelming. You know, at this point, I had been involved in the case for 24 years. And I had numerous other strong suspects that I had eliminated with DNA. So when I'm sitting in front of his house, I'm debating. You know, is, what are you debating? Is, is he really the guy or not? Hmm. 
and I've been here before, and, and maybe I should just go up to the door, knock on the door like I've done before, and just introduce myself. Hi, I'm Paul Holes. You know, your name came up in an investigation. You know, your former cop, you know what it's like. Uh, if I can get your DNA, we'll eliminate you and move on. But then I started thinking about, well, all the things that led me to be in front of his house. I said, oh, what if he is? Mm -hmm. And it was so hard to drive away. And that was literally the last thing I did as a sworn officer. The next day, I'm turning in my badge and gun. I was an <sighs> FBI task force officer. I'm turning in my FBI creds and being debriefed. And then walking home with a little box of, you know, from my desk as a county employee that's now retired. Yeah, the visual of this, I mean, you're outside and then you leave, but, but you've never... You were never outside, because I don't imagine with that little box going home to the new chapter in your life, it would be impossible to leave that behind after searching for him for so many years. So then you see this break in the case, and he's identified. I remember that press conference very vividly. I remember seeing breaking news, you know, that they were going to make this announcement. What was it like for you to hear his name and the confirmation of it. Yeah, so I, I couldn't, even though I was now retired, I kept working the yes. case. And then so I was getting updates on the surveillance. And finally, they had gotten a, a surreptitious yeah. DNA sample. And I get a call. You know, I'm meeting with my wife at P.F. Chang's. <laughs> and I step out and I get the call from a Sacramento DA yeah. investigator saying, Paul, you can't tell anybody. Oh. But the DNA so has yeah. come back. Yeah, yeah. Right? And so that was the moment for me where it's like, after 24 years, mm. I now know who the Golden State Killer is. Yeah, and it's... <laughs> it, comes, it comes with great justice, but it came at a cost because you talk about um, the pain that it caused with your family, your relationships, marriage. This all comes with a cost to have that dedication to finding the truth and unmasking killers. You know, this case, you know, and, and, and there's many cases in, in my career, but this case in particular became such a, an obsession. In part is because I wanted to solve it. In part, I got to know some of the victims or victims' yeah. families, and it became an obligation. So for the last 10 years of my career, I was 24-7, 365, either working the case or thinking about it. And of course, being so consumed with all that energy and emotional energy, I'm distant from my family. I'm sitting at the table thinking about the next thing I need to do on the case while the family is sitting there right, having... So you're not present in your life um, because you are committed to helping other people. I know you described GSK, the Golden State Killer, and how it began to consume you in the book. Take a listen. The obsession ran over into weekends while I was mowing the lawn or playing with the kids. Even on Christmas Day, when the rest of my family opened presents, it was GSK who was on my mind. And through the long nights, when I searched computer databases for clues and drew geographic profiles of his crimes to try to determine his home base, the case played like an endless movie in my head. I mean, the, the, the mental health spiral that you hear as you describe that. I mean, you heard the audience say, wow, we, we hear the mental health spiral. Well, and, and that's what I didn't recognize was happening to me, right. you know, because within law enforcement, we see horrible things, but you can't show weakness, yeah. you know? And so you stuff it inside. And it wasn't until after I retired and I was working a case out in Fort Worth, Texas, a 1974 homicide. Is it really? Yes, it okay. is. You know, little Carla Walker, mm -hmm. 17 years old, was abducted and her body was found. And now I'm sitting in front of her family on camera, mm -hmm. giving them an update because I was trying to help solve that case for a show. And I just start breaking down. Yeah. Um, and then ultimately I go in to see a therapist where I live. And she said, Paul, every time you stuff something in after seeing mm -hmm. something horrible, you know, you got a little nick. Now, after 30 years of doing it, yeah. I've got so many nicks I'm bleeding out psychologically. Oh. And I'm that's... so happy that you're revealing that for law enforcement and also even, as I said, just a reporter covering crime. I remember covering this thing and I was pregnant with my son at the time and I'm reading about this woman who was murdered in Oklahoma and she was pregnant. The killer didn't know it. And I kept reliving her last seconds in this forest by herself. And I start crying now when I think about it. And I was just like, I can't. Yeah. This is, it, it, it takes a certain type of person and you are that person who can do that and solve the crime. And I think that's why so many of these victims, they see you as a hero to them and law enforcement for telling these stories. Well, 
how you know the, the victims are why I do it. Yeah. You know that that really is, and it's it's the, the victim whose life has been taken, um, stolen away. Yeah. Also the the, the loved ones. Uh, you know I get to know the victims' families, and I become very personally attached to the victims. You know oftentimes I'll be inside a house and I'm seeing this woman or this child laying there and then looking at the photographs on the wall of them enjoying life and seeing the horrors of what an offender has done. But I, I take it home with me, yeah. you know, and I can, there's one case I write about where a father killed his two young daughters and then himself. And that, you know, one of the daughters had the same shoes that my young son had at the same time. So now I'm associating, yeah. just like you, with your, during your pregnancy, yeah. you're, a, you're, you're empathizing with you're that You're empathizing victim. with, and, and you need that but it comes, as we said, with a, at a cost. But one thing that you have done is you've had that can't stop, won't stop mentality because even with those nicks, you've learned to take care of yourself while taking care of others.